Chevette. <laughs> the car is Chevette. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Martin. Welcome to another Casio live stream. We have a very, very special guest joining us today. But before we get to that special guest, first, I want to bring in my co-host for this and every other episode we have here. Joining me 814 miles to my east. I did look it up. How you doing, Rich? <laughs> You, you, you argued with me last time about how many miles it was, so I Googled it. I was it. just, you know, I was unsure because the number keeps jumping around. I wasn't sure exactly what it is, but 814 sounds fine to me. It is. Um, I'm, it's, that's the right one? <laughs> that is the exact number of miles. So All right, I believe good. I've been bouncing around from 832 to 870 miles. And yeah. Yeah, yeah some, <laughs> that's about the range. Yeah. But technically. But I'm doing great. Uh, as usual, I have no justifiable complaints. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we got a great show for you today. Awesome. Well, joining us. All, well, actually, a little bit further. Could be around 850 miles <laughs> to my east. And, and just across the water from you, Rich, is, is a really amazing artist. Uh, he's a New York City-based organist, pianist, synthesist, keyboard player of all kinds. You might have heard about him in Keyboard Magazine, or you've heard one of his 19 amazing albums. Uh, he's played with everyone, my goodness. Uh, we're going to get into his career, his background, everything. Welcome to the show, Mr. Brian Charette. Welcome, Brian. Hi, you guys. What a pleasure to be with you. Thanks so much for being here, Brian. Oh, it's my awesome. pleasure. <laughs> you guys know my first keyboard was a Casio keyboard. We wow. heard that. Do you remember which one it was? CT310. I'd put the audio accompaniment on and get on Cosmotone and play Jump. <laughs> awesome. that's that's fantastic i that's was for... so i was 12 in 1984 i just got my first fake book and i was i was all about it you know and uh, i have such fond memories so this is very full circle moment for me that's that's outstanding well that's we're going to talk more about cassie Tone. well actually let's just dive right in brian i would love to know about your beginnings as a musician you had your first casio tone when you were 12 but where did it start for playing, you well i had a piano in my house i had a wurlitzer upright piano my mother was an excellent my parents were both school teachers my mother played the piano very very well um not professionally but she's basically amazing at everything um and i would just go down there from four and just play the piano all day long you know um so it was really the first thing that i did in a lot of ways um and i started to take lessons when i was really young i started to work professionally in music i think i was 14. so it's it's wow. kind of the only thing i've ever done is play keyboard instruments professionally i guess so with lessons in your early beginnings were you were you I guess, where did you start? Did you start with classical music, or when did you get involved started, with jazz? Or tell us I a little bit about that. I started with classical music. Um, I studied with a gentleman named George McKinstry. Um, I'm from Meriden, Connecticut, and he was very strict teacher, very excellent teacher. I practiced all my scales. I basically played ragtime music. I played inventions. So, you know, by the time I was... 10 or 12, I could read music and play music and, and was into it. You know, I was super into Keith Emerson, oh, wow. okay. um, who I also had the pleasure to know and to play with, actually. That's an amazing story. Oh, that's great. Um, and uh, I started to play jazz when I was in high school. I got into a jazz band, and I lost an audition, which really upset me. And I became obsessed with practicing the piano, I would say, when I was about 12 or 13. And I entered, like, all state competitions, and I started studying with everyone I could. Um, and I started playing music about when I was 14. And, uh, and here we are, you know. Amazing. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Uh, so when did, I mean... Organ is a big part of, of what you do. Um, when did organ become a, a, a fascination or a major instrument for you? You started on very, piano. 
very by mistake. I didn't play organ at all. So I moved to New York in 1994. I think I was 21 years old. And I was trying to get work like everyone, and I didn't have a lot in the beginning. Um, at the time, I had come from living in the Hartford area, and I was doing lots of gigs there. And I would go on tours. We used to call it the Chitlin Circuit, which are like blues clubs where I would play with a lot of different people. Uh, and I needed to get a portable organ rig for the blues tours I was doing. These are artists, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they are Percy Struthers was one gentleman, Lee Shot Williams. I was recording for an English blues label called JSP Records and played with many of their artists. So I got this, which was very new at the time, Hammond XB2 with a small Leslie. And I live, I lived at that time in the East Village. You know, I lived in the building on the cover of Physical Graffiti, that Led Zeppelin record. Oh, wow. Um, oh, cool. And it's also the video um, Waiting on a Friend, the doorstep Mick is sitting on. So that was my first New York apartment. And right down the street, the bar that's actually in the video Waiting on a Friend was called the St. Mark's Bar. And they had a lot of jazz music in there. So I remember unpacking this XB2 Hammond rig that I got from Goff in my kitchen. And that night I got a call to play organ right down the street at St. Mark's Bar, which would be the first places that I played organ in New York. And a lot of people would hang out there and they saw me playing organ. So many of my New York friends don't even know me as playing piano, even though I do wow. play a lot of piano. But in New York, I play mostly organ. That's very cool. And it's cool that you started on on such hallowed ground there. There's musical DNA and where you're living. I'm sure the uh, the, the spirit of that totally. carried forward in, in totally. your playing. And you know, guys, I don't know if you know the organist, Jack McDuff, but I learned to oh, play yeah. organ oh, yeah. in Showman's in Harlem, which is a good place to learn the, how to play the B3 on Jack McDuff's organ. Um, my first studio in New York was with George Coleman Jr., who was son of, of course, George Coleman from Miles Davis, second quintet. We're like friends. We've recorded together. So just by being in this neighborhood and around all these people, I'm just, you know, rubbing elbows with a lot of people who have obviously taught me a, a lot about everything, you know. Very, very cool. Um, just want to point out to everybody, we are watching the chat on uh, YouTube and Facebook. So if you have comments or questions for Brian, please feel free to, uh, to type them in and we will get to them as quickly as we can. Um, I'm curious. I see some, some nice looking synths in the background there. We've seen lots of synthesizers yeah. in your live streams. When did you start getting into synthesis and involving synths in your playing? I was always into it. Um... I was actually, when I first moved to New York, I was doing a lot of production work. And I had like an early Pro Tools LE rig when that was the thing. And when that stuff came out, a lot of people started having sessions in their bedroom, like I did, you know. And I was very into the virtual instruments. Um, I had at a time all of the old analog synths, like Junos and JX8P. So I'm, you know, I've always been super into gear. Right now, you know, this is the stuff that I use for my live stream that I do every Tuesday night for my Facebook page. Yep. This is a Korg mini log. This is Arturia drum brood impact. On the other side, you might not be able to see it as an Arturio micro freak. I just have a simple zoom mixer in the back, a little hanger if you want to put your suit up. <laughs> this is just this is <laughs> this is just a controller. Um, I'm usually using IK Multimedia BX3, right. which is designed by Hammond, and I was actually even in on that in a very, very small way. I'm the reason it has a split, maybe. Um, this is uh, DeepMind 12, um, and here are your axes, you guys. Here's the new Cassia tone, and here's my Privia. So. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're going to have yeah. to ask for some, some kickback money for mentioning all these other brands here, but uh, that's all right. Oh, is that I'm not? Sure are you not supposed oh, to Oh, no, it's that? all good. It's all good, Brian. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, I'm just kidding. We definitely want to hear some more about the uh, about how you're using the Casios in the studio in a little bit. Um, 
I, I was curious about some of the some of the places you play. You know, I, you know, being a New York based musician, you have access to all these great spots, and you've you've played at you played at Smalls and the Roxy and all these other great places. Do you have any favorite spots to play or favorite types of venues that you feel sure. you perform best in? I mean, I don't know if I, I don't know if the venue determines how I sound so much. Mm-hmm. But I love to play at Smalls in New York. It's kind of where we all go and hang out. Um, I love to play at the Jazz Dock in Prague. Um, We were just playing in Mary Ann's Jazz Room in Bern, Switzerland, which I love because it's so simple. You play all week in this place. Um, I played in Carnegie Hall one time. That was the best piano I've ever played, I have to say. Wow. Um, I played in the garden one time, and the piano had all the insides taken out, so it couldn't make a sound. <laughs> but that was pretty awesome. I was playing with Talia, and it was like it was for the Latin Grammy Awards, and there was like it was me on stage. I was dressed up in like a 17th century powdered wig, and I had like <laughs> swirling. It was the Knicks cheerleaders like swirling around me while I played like rock me Amadeus with Talia. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I play a fair, I play in a fair amount of castles in Eastern Europe, which is really incredible. I don't know if you guys have ever been in any of these old castles that they have in Eastern Europe, but they're all over the place when you go over there. So, so Brian, that's not a sentence you hear very often. I play in a lot of castles. Well, if you go, if you go to the Czech Republic and East, they're there, you know, they're there. And it's a very mystical area of the world. And I feel like it's a part of the world where a lot of people don't always go, you know, a lot of people go to Western Europe, but you know, it's, it's really, I've, I've been going there for many years and I'm just, I used to live in Prague half the time, you know, I'm very in love with this area of the world, you know, Hey Brian, are these are these solo gigs or are these with with groups? Tell tell nope, us a little bit. Almost, I mean, because we see you always, weekly on your live stream at home in in the room that we've got, you know, this view of right now, and that's where I see a lot of your music. Um, but what kinds of gigs are these? Tell us a little bit about that. Live, I almost always play with a group. I feel like it's actually pretty uncommon for the o- you know the only place I really play live is from my streams. Most of the other times, I'm playing with some sort of jazz group, but I also play with pop acts sometimes. I'm usually playing organ, um, but often playing organ and a bunch of other keyboards, too. Um, sometimes I'm just playing piano. Um, there are jazz groups or rock groups or fusion groups. It's, it's definitely all different kinds. And I do more of my own concerts as time goes on. Like most of my concerts when I'm traveling, a lot of them are, are mine where I put together groups. And I have a lot of different kinds of groups. I have large ensembles. Like I, uh, I'm going to Budapest in a couple of weeks and I've written music for a brass orchestra, which I've never done before which is going to be jazz trio and a brass orchestra. Uh, and then I have other, like I've written music for big band and organ, and I have small bu- uh, group music too. So it's really a little bit of everything, you know. Amazing. Um, so That's the easy part. That- <laughs> <laughs> so you've also had a chance to play with uh, some musical heroes, and we were talking about one in particular before we went live uh, behind the scenes in the green room um, that you met and played with Keith Emerson. I want to hear about that, but uh, you're playing with Joey D. I mean, absolutely, you're surrounding yourself with some amazing players. Any good stories? Any good stories? I knew. <laughs> yeah, I knew. The I knew two presidents from the Czech Republic, like not super well, but I knew them. Like Havel, who is one of the most beloved presidents, he's kind of he was the president during the Velvet Revolution when Czech Republic stopped being communist. Basically, the wow. gentleman that I started to go to the Czech Republic with, his name is Lazo Deci. He was a political prisoner with Havel in 1968 in Prague Spring. 
So he was like best friends with the gentleman. So when we would go to Prague, we'd basically p play concerts in, pra in Prague Castle, like the, you know, what would for us be going to the White House, I guess. Um, and uh, that was really amazing. Playing with George Coleman has been amazing. He's actually, uh, he's kind of a neighbor of mine. Um, playing with Vinny Caliuta was incredible. Um, so many of these people I've known my whole life, just from a Casio perspective, we were talking, Mike, about Ed Alstrom, who designed the That's Beats right. on those old Casio keyboards. That's Ed, right. I don't know if you guys know him, but he's a great organist. He plays at Yankee Stadium. We've oh, yeah. become really Definitely. good friends. So what's amazing for me is to come full circle, to start out in the beginning of my life with some experiences and then just have this lovely bookend like this on the on the end of it you know and i think all you th the lesson for me like i don't even know if i was super talented or super smart but if you play nice in the sandbox and you work really hard at something and you're just easy to be with you can do whatever you want you know and especially now during this difficult time with obviously everything that's going on to go someplace and go la 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 or hit a couple notes, somebody pays you and thank you. I mean, that's incredibly fortunate way to go through your life. Nobody gets hurt, you know. Um, so I just feel very fortunate, you know. I hope that answers awesome. the question. We were playing nice yeah. in the sandbox. That's great, great advice. And it sounds yeah. like, you know, when you moved to New York, that's that's what you did. And you, you started going places and... And you were well, nice when I guy. moved here, it wasn't. It was a tougher town when I moved here. Not that it was like you know, oh my God, New York in the '90s is way back in the '90s is super tough, but it was a little more lawless. There was a lot of drugs on the street, and you don't really see that anymore. Like there's a lot. It's a lot safer than it used to be. Um, and I think music, the musical community of New York, is actually very friendly to one another i i find i mean i'm sure i'm sure me being friendly helps that but uh, i find it very welcoming especially if you've done one or two things and if you're cool and you have something interesting to do with your art this is a great place to be you know yeah totally agree yeah um well you've played with so many awesome people and it's tough to single out uh, stories. We, we would love to hear about Keith Emerson. I'm also really curious uh, what it was like playing with uh, Chaka Khan. She might have been my favorite, you know. Uh, we were, Chaka Khan, we were playing, there was a concert promoter, uh, there is a concert promoter named Danny Capillion, and he would put on these amazing shows. So one year in Central Park, he put on a show called Joni's Jazz which was all the jazz music of Joni Mitchell. Joni was there, she sang. Uh, Jane Sibbery sang, Shaka Khan sang, Joe Jackson was there. And I was playing in the band for the show, basically. Um, Shaka Khan, to stand very close to her and hear her sing was uh, a very unsettling palpable physical experience for me like her voice <laughs> the vibration of it was was really something you know um i remember i also played with george coleman at the blue note which was a really big moment in my life that it was sold out both sets which is not easy to do big jazz club and i was listening to him play and i'm like yup that's basically the dude that you listened to when you were 14 like around the clock and there he is right there and he's like your friend mm. um that was incredible i played with michael mcdonald he had an amazing voice wow. <laughs> um, i remember one year i was doing the kennedy center honors do you know you guys know the mark twain awards yeah yeah definitely so i was doing it one year for steve martin Oh, okay. We played with Steve Martin. Steve Martin played banjo. And we were there for like two or three days rehearsing and all this stuff. All these amazing actresses were there. 
Um, I didn't know who Scarlett Johansson was at the time, but I looked to my right one day, and there she was standing, and I was like, <laughs> no. Um, I remember it was some, it might have been the Super Bowl time. I can't remember what big game was on TV, but we were backstage. There was kind of this old, crusty couch, and I was sitting on the couch watching this game with Larry David sitting here and Tom Hanks, who oh, was wow. the MC, <laughs> sitting here. And we're just sitting there like watching a football game. So, you know, it's really an amazing experience to, uh, to be going, playing music. <laughs> it's amazing, you know. <laughs> never, that, never a dull moment. I met my wife uh, playing music. She's also a very talented artist. We met in Prague. Um, and I just played piano for her is how I met her first, you know. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep on playing the piano. Yeah, it seems to be working out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so talking a little bit about your live streams, you've been doing a ton of them uh, recently, obviously, because it's a, it's a great thing to do when, when we can't get out and play live. But we love the Tuesday night electronica. It's just me too. It's so me great. too. And I was wondering, has doing these live streams opened up any new kind of creative avenues for you or made you think about playing in a different way? How has it helped your creativity? Well, it's interesting. I, I, I have to say I always feel creative. I never feel not creative. Um, when I sit at an instrument, it's actually when all the voices stop in my head. So it's actually a big, it's a big, it's a big relief for me to sit just behind an instrument. And you know who I think helped me very much with this was Kenny Werner. Do you guys know Kenny Werner and effort, effortless mastery? Do you know this guy? I do not I don't think so. He's kind of a jazz guru. He wrote a very popular book for artists who struggle with being too much in their head called effortless mastery. And I studied with him for a little while and when I was pretty young. And he really helped me to, when I sit in an instrument, it, everything else kind of goes away and I become immersed in the instrument itself. So what the stream has really done for me is, you know, I have the mix perfectly in my room of all of these instruments. So it's really easy to control. And it's kind of the, if you try to take this somewhere and do it, I'm sure you guys have the experience trying to set all this stuff up and get it to right. work and have the mixes right is very, very complicated. These things are set up and they stay exactly there. So in a way, I almost feel like it's my most authentic artistic output. And it's dollless, it's live, um, it's just me and these machines. And, and for me, it's... I'm completely in control of the music that's going on. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's no mistakes, but everything that's going on is, is tailored by me. So I can really find my voice with it because I'm in charge of all the instruments. Uh, well, which is, you, you said it, and, and this I think is what's really unique about your stream is we say electronica, and sometimes it is purely that but other times, of course, it's f it's the piano with with groove boxes and bass lines going yeah. on in the background, sure. or Hammond organ and groove boxes and other things going sure. on at the same time. It's completely unique. And just to give people who haven't seen it a little taste, I've got about a sixty second clip I'm going to run here. So let's okay. let's take a look at that, and we'll talk about it after.
So really, really, really cool stuff. I mean, and that's just a small taste. I've got a few other clips we'll run we'll run later, but it's. I mean, again, it's super unique because of the the range of instruments you're using, but I like to see that it's it's usually grounded with either piano or organ, and that's that's sure. pretty cool. Well, that's that's what my foundation is, you know, for sure. But it's also really cool to see to see you bending genres and and breathing new life into them with uh, with with all the synths and. I love how you latch on to a rhythm, make some tweaks to it, then do something different with with the organ or the piano. You you seem to react and and sort of breathe with the synths. Well, you know, uh, it's a it's than, a full it's improvisation with it's like more. You know, it's many. You're improvising with a whole set of instruments as as opposed to just one. So it's really, to me, it's very challenging. It's the most challenging thing I do. And you have to be in control of it. You have to be in control is, is the thing that you really have to do, is you have to be very centered. And I think it, you were asking me before, Michael, how has it changed my approach? It's made me very centered. And when I'm playing one instrument now, it's almost like I'm always swinging like three baseball bats when I'm doing all of this stuff. <laughs> so if, I'm in, if I know what the harmony is and I can deal with the music or whatever, it's made me more laser focused i would say well this is how we know you're going to be great at doing those horn arrangements well we'll see you know I, i'm good at sibelius and the note turns red when it's too high <laughs> so that's like well which i mean this leads to my next question i mean you have you have 19 albums um out there which incredibly I'm well sorry. reviewed I'm they're so always sorry. up at the top I'm of the ready. charts no they're fantastic i was reading one of the reviews from downbeat magazine but are you the kind of guy that works on on multiple things at once, or or do you have to stay laser focused on on one thing until you finish it and before you move on to the next? I'm working on a lot of things all the time, and they're always on a deadline. I'll get called for a recording session and have to write a bunch of music, or I'll get called like this thing in Hungary. I know the gentleman who works with the orchestra. We worked together for years. I was playing with him last year in Hungary he's like how would you like to write some music for the modern art orchestra I'm like sure um, so it has a lot of times I have a deadline and I'm writing for something it's not like it's just oh I'm gonna see where the muse takes me it has it has a point on it a lot and I will have an instrumentation and a very clear Usually somebody will, either the record company or whoever I am working with, will give me a pretty clear framework of what I'm going to be working in. And then I just do it. You know, I don't know what I'm doing all the time. I don't know how to write really, really well for English horn. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> you know. Um, but I just do it, and I hope I just don't get vibe too hard, you know. <laughs> Trial by fire, baby. Yeah. <laughs> So you're also teaching at the new school, and I suppose a lot of that has been online the last 18, 19 months at this point. I teach, I teach for a few places. I mostly teach for the 92nd Street Y, um, but I do teach for the new school also. Um, and I have a few online things like that, and I teach I, most of all of my teaching is over Zoom right now. It is. All, all of it, yeah. And, and I teach much more since Corona than I ever did before. Like it, it was a, that was basically how most of us survived was teaching Zoom lessons, you know. And I was fortunate to have a lot of people who wanted to study. So that's fantastic. And do you think? I mean, you see that continuing? You don't think it's gonna? Well, of course, we'll get back to the way some things were in in the past, but I bet you have students from all over the world that you're able to do this with now yeah. that you wouldn't have been and able to. For me, you know, for me, a lot of the institutions want to have in-person lessons. It's better for their business, of course. Um, for me, if I don't have to travel an hour to get to some place to teach someone, it's it's like a third of the time for me to teach that lesson, you know. So for me, it's obviously a lot easier. I also think people like to be in their comfortable environments. If I have a student who's familiar with their 
piano and their surroundings, they're going to be more comfortable in a, in a lesson. I think I, lo I love it. I love it. That's awesome. That's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, uh, I know we were talking a bit more about that in the, uh, in the green room beforehand as well. Um, you mentioned that you think a lot of things that are happening with, with zoom lessons and things like that are going to stick around. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we've spoken to a number of music educators who definitely agree uh, that, you know, this, this isn't, Zoom is not going to go away once we're able to, you know, fully meet in person again. It's, it's dragged us kicking and screaming to where we should have been 15 or 20 years ago with, with video conferencing. So it's, guys, it's I think this is going to be, I think, you know, this time with Corona is going to be in history, one of the most significant times maybe since the Vietnam War for America or World War II. I don't know. It's, it, was, it changed everything and will change everything. The way economies will work after, I mean, there's going to probably be a little bit of a correction at a point, but how money is going to be used and, and sent to people, how we're going to communicate with each other, it's going to be completely different after this. And some of the things that, like Zoom, are never going away. Like people aren't going to go back to the other way, I think. Right. Yeah. Sure. Well, I was hoping we could switch gears for a second. Uh, uh, I read <laughs> one interesting detail about you that I, that I loved, and that is that you have a black sash in, uh, in white crane kung fu. Um, and I'm I'm an old Shotokan karate guy, but uh, I was oh, wondering, nice. do you I did, see? I did wash and rue karate in the beginning. Oh, great! With Hideo, nice with Hideo Chai. <laughs> it uh, might have been I called wash and rue at that point. Wash and rue, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any overlap between that aspect of who you are and your musicality? Does one discipline affect the other? Absolutely, and I'm not interested. Although I've studied the martial aspects of martial arts my interest in it now is just uh cultivation of my chi and attaining enlightenment to be honest you know and as it relates to music so it's completely you know the interesting thing you say kung fu the literal translation of kung fu is hard work over a long period of time which is exactly what this is you know um so I do a lot of the breathing things while I play. I do a very kind of mystical kind of breathing. I was breathing called microcosmic orbit. And if I'm doing it as I play, I detach from my egoic self, which can make me play not as well. Um, <laughs> so I'm always approaching it from that kind of uh, perspective trying to not own it, trying to be just a vessel for it to pass through, whatever that means. Um, and I use these studies to try to cultivate that. And I am not perfect at it yet. I'm going to come clean with you. I still have a ways to go. We're always learning. Yeah. So I, here, I'm going to jump in. Um, Brian, that instrument to your left, I got to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> that one right there. You know, yeah. um, there aren't many 88 note instruments that could fit in a room that size. That's for sure. <laughs> tell it's us very nicely here. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your thoughts on the PXS 3000. It's obviously a huge part of what you're doing on your live streams. What, what do you enjoy about it? Um, I mean, did you, did you review it for keyboard magazine? I can't remember. I reviewed it for electronic musician in February, maybe three years ago, February issue. Maybe it's easy to find. <laughs> um, I loved it. I love it. I love the action. I think it's a very balanced action and it's very in the middle of every kind of piano I play so for me especially playing a lot of organ where the action is lighter the main thing that I like is that I can work out on a piano action that is going to make it is going to make me in shape when I go to play piano someplace so that's the first thing I like I love the sounds I love the buttons on the side so sometimes even though I use this mostly for piano or whirly sounds. 
I can switch to a pad sound and I can control it with the knobs over here. It might be hard to see, yeah. but there's two knobs here that are assignable. Um, and I don't, I don't even know if there are assignable knobs like that on digital pianos. I mean, maybe there are, but I feel like that's kind of uncommon. Um, yeah, at, at that price range, it's certainly uncommon. Right. That's another thing. It's not expensive. And I love the other sound bank with all of the world instruments. Oh, that's um, great. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's got great beats on here. I don't really use the beats on here, but I could if I needed to. This one, this is just sexy, this one over here. It's just sexy. <laughs> you know? Um, and how about that speaker system? I'm going to put words in your mouth, but, I, but it's, tell it's us about really your experience good. when you first played it. I really dug it. As we were talking before, my first keyboard was a CT. So this is the same family, right? Yep. My 310 and this are the same, are related. Um, so it's really nice for me to have one again. My mother sold that in a uh, garage, scale, uh, garage sale years ago. So I haven't had that for many years. But I'm really glad to have this. You know, if I was going to go to a gig and I needed a bunch of different sounds and no mess this would be the one right here it's light um i dig it you know i think it looks cool um <laughs> it's got a lot of different sounds it has uh some original casio tones on there as well that were on those earlier models which is cool um i really like the effects where you can put the effects um on the sounds if you want I my favorite thing about the organ sounds is that as you press harder, it sounds like more draw bars comes. <laughs> the come advanced out, which, the advanced organ tones very very unique. That's I'm yeah, glad that's, you like that. That's, I've never seen anything like that. So as I press harder, more draw bars come out. You know. Yep. So that's really cool, especially if you practice with it. You can. It's almost like you're switching draw bars on a real organ has great synth sounds. Um, what did I hear in here? I heard some kind of brass sound that was really cool. Yeah, you know. Almost like OBX8 or some kind of stuff like, right. like that. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> is, that what that, is that what that's supposed to be? Yep, that's exactly what so there, it is. <laughs> so there you go. So it's also very easy to navigate. It's simple. You yeah. know, so, you know, if I was going to go to a gig and I didn't want to bring this big uh, piano because I don't have a car. I've lived in New York for so many years. This is super light, super easy. Doesn't it even, does it have a handle on it somewhere or something? Yep, on the back, yeah. Yep, there it is. Um, you know, that's what I'm talking about, man. Um, well, and I don't know if you've yeah. noticed, Brian, because you haven't had it that long, but there are strap pins on the front of it. You can, I've you noticed. Can, strap I think you have plenty of guitars in your house as well. So I have a guitar, but I've been playing guitar too, you guys. I have like I play a real guitar. Well, now you have now you have another one because yeah, so maybe I'm gonna go key two, one. <laughs> I'm gonna go two. I'm gonna go two guitars. You know what you might appreciate? Uh, it also takes six AA batteries, and we have right. an optional Bluetooth. Do I have one here? There's there's a Bluetooth uh, wireless audio and MIDI adapter. So if you wanted to roam around totally. without any wires and control your other synths, uh, and even more important than that, like that, when you're in another country, if you don't have the power adapter, if you have batteries, it's never a thing. You know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, good point. So, so you, I I love having battery powered stuff when I go on the road because powers you know you can the powers cannot match up sometimes too one time i was in thailand i had a b3 it played a minor third sharp the whole night oh. because the power wasn't <laughs> oh, so oh, oh. <laughs> so to have stuff re to have stuff regulated uh to have stuff powered by batteries for me is, is really big you know i hope the b3 was okay after that i think it was it's just you know very complicated instrument b3s right so, Brian, have you in your in all your gigging in the city, at least prior to to COVID, were you gigging with the Privio? Did you get did you put that in the in the gig bag and take it out to clubs, or 
Um, you mentioned you don't have a car, so I was curious. I haven't taken it to clubs, but I will take this one. This is kind of my piano here for practicing. And a lot of my gigs in New York, I do play organ. Or if I play piano, there's a piano there. Like you're talking right. about smalls. Like a lot of these places have good pianos. So I don't usually have to bring uh, a piano. I ha When I have had to play keyboard sounds, I've been bringing my XB2. But that is going to be replaced by this guy here now. That's um, awesome. <laughs> because it's lighter and... It has more, I don't want to say it has more sounds because XB2 has a lot of sounds, but this has a lot of, if I'm playing some kind of thing where, where I'm playing pop and I need like a, here, let me get this kind of like glassy, uh, modern, like this kind of sound. This is not really on my XB2. This is almost like a DX electric mm -hmm. piano maybe yeah. or something like that. Right. And if I'm playing a pop gig and I need a couple keyboards, this keyboard has a lot of those kinds of sounds that are already on there, and you can layer the sounds, too. Yeah. I, Rich, Rich and I, I guess, Rich, you, you came up with this. It's The sound set in the CTS-1 is is a wink and a nod to, to keyboard players everywhere. It's all the things that you want to have. You've got transistor you organs. Yeah. There. You know, the organs, the synths, right. the vintage sounds, the classic Casio, and, of course, great pianos, electric pianos, and more. It's, it's, it's so much fun. And it's hard have to find the, uh, the Mellotron flutes yet. Sure, sure, love it, love it, love it. <laughs> Good stuff. So, so oh, go ahead, Brian or Rich. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask, what's next for you? What uh, what projects are you working on uh, right now that we can look forward to? Well, this weekend I'm going to Canada, um, and I'm going to play. Um, I'm actually going to record in November at Rudy Van Gelder's studio where all of the Blue Note recordings were made. And I've never been there before. I'm recording with a gentleman named Corey Weeds, who has a record label named Seller Live. So I've written some music for that session that we're going to try this weekend in Vancouver. Then I come back to New York. I'm going to play at the 55 bar, I think, on the 27th. And then I'm going to Europe for the whole month of October. I'm going to be in Hungary, Czech Republic, and Spain playing with a bunch wow. of different groups. The whole month. I'll be gone the whole month. So that's going to be <laughs> – keep your fingers crossed for me. I have, oh, wow. I have 105 N95 masks. Um, <laughs> wow. And I'm just going to be careful and – Yep. Be safe. And – Try to yeah, be okay. It's going to be do. wild. I was in Europe last week, and it's it's not as safe as here. It's not not as many, you know, uh, people are vaccinated, and I know that's a hot topic. Um, so I don't want to get into that. But it's you know it's it's dangerous to be out in the world now, obviously. And I'm just it's my first time doing this back, and it's it's another level of uh, <laughs> of complication. I have to get tested a lot, you know. And you got to sure. make sure if you're in a, in a country for a couple days, you got to make sure you get it so you have enough time to get the, you know, it's it's a little complicated now. That's tough, you know? yeah. yeah. So Brian, but I but, think I've gotten everything ironed out, so I'm hoping for the best. Oh, best Great. of luck. But before before we, we leave, and we've only got a few more minutes, but I want to play another clip and then and then talk about it when we get back. Uh, here's here's sure. another clip Brian sent me. Uh, very cool, just... Play about 60 seconds of this piece. Our day will come When we'll have everything We'll share the joy Holding and love can bring No one can tell me that I'm too young to know I love you so And you love me Our day will come If we just wait a while 
No tears for us Think of and wear a smile Our dreams are magic because We'll always stay in love with our day When he'll come I just want to say, Brian, you, we talked about this earlier. You said that you're not a vocalist, but damn, you've got a great that voice. Sounds pretty that, good. that sounds not great. True. It sounds so, so good. I actually, I liked it listening to it. You know, it's singing is all about control too. Like when you hear really good singers, that's really a thing. And I don't know if I'm quite there yet, but you know, my wife is a singer. So I, I study singing with her. I mean, I don't study formally, but I work on it, especially when uh, we were first sheltered in place. I was doing those videos just to try to cheer everybody up, you know. Um, so, yeah, wow. I started really singing awesome. more. Yeah. Yeah. I, you sent me a couple of clips again. So I guess that brings us to the last topic, which is where can people go to 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 hear more of your music, to find out where you're going to be playing, all of those things. So easy to find. I mean, my website, briancharette.com, B-R-I-A-N-C-H-A-R-E-T. There it is. There Brian, it is. There it is. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Thank you. Oh, my God. Where are you when I need you? Um, but my music is it's very easy to find. And, you know, you can just write to me, too. I'm not like a per. You know, I, I, I write to people all the time. Uh, who who write to me you can write through the website i even think i have my there's uh email or uh social media so i'm i'm pretty accessible you know well we really appreciate you spending this time with us and sharing oh. about your 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 beginnings in music and everything you're up to it's really inspiring I'm, I'm i'm thrilled that you guys have me on i love your instruments i've been playing them since the very beginning and i'm going to be playing them until the very end so oh. thank awesome. you for that. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for taking the time and for sharing your, your talent and your insight with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, you guys. All right. With that being said, everybody, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. Ring that bell. Subscribe to our channels so you'll be notified about our next Artist Spotlight. But for now, I'm Mike Martin. Rich. I'm Rich Formadoni. Brian. Waves from New York. Hi, everybody. Take care, everybody.